Hey guys, today I want to talk about the Amazon Web Services or AWS. This uh, service provided by Amazon is actually one of the nicest services that have come out uh, in recent years for uh, being able to basically host your own web sites or servers uh, and being in control of the service that you are getting. One of the problems that I've had in the past with hosting providers is that um, basically you're kind of playing craps because if you, if you purchase a hosting service on a shared basis, uh, you may or may not get what you pay for, for the sheer fact that you don't know that if you're sharing that in quote shared service with a uh, major gaming site or a video site, or uh, any of a number of high, either high bandwidth, high memory, or high CPU uh, computer systems, uh, websites, that, uh, that basically kind of hog up the whole shared use. And most of the time, what I find is it's kind of touch and go. Sometimes you get a nice system, sometimes you get a system that just uh, doesn't seem to respond or, or uh, is really laggy or just kind of a disappointment all around. And I've tried all the systems, I mean, at least all the ones in the United States, uh, over the decades that I've been doing web design, whether it was for my own companies or for customers, those systems just have never really uh, been that nice. One of the other big problems with using a hosting service is downtime. And that's basically when they go to do, you know, major software upgrades or maybe major service upgrades or hardware, or there is a crash in the system or anything really that, you know, affects any type of hosting uh, company. Um, well, when you, when you call them up and, and try and figure out how long your system is going to be down or how long your customer systems are going to be down, whether that's email or a high, a high volume or storefront or something of that nature for your customers, or even just a billboard. You know, when, once that happens and you have to tell your customers, yeah, I know it's down. I have no idea when it'll be up. I don't exactly know what's wrong with the system. Uh, that is, you know, the nature of dealing with a hosting service. Um, that's not really a good answer to have for your customers and your customers certainly don't understand that, right? They've hired you because they don't understand the service, server side of, web, of the web interface. And the answer of, well, you know, basically I don't know, it's out of my hands, it's the company that, we, that I recommended that you use, uh, is, is a bad position to be in. Well, the nice thing about the AWS systems is, is that you're in complete control. So if something goes down or something goes wrong to back up, restore, to bring up a new server, to do really anything to get that system back up and running uh, is literally minutes. So in most cases, by the time your customer would even know that something had happened to their website, you're already in the process of bringing it up a new server. That is something that's nice, especially if you get a phone call or an email and your response gets to be, Yes, I caught it when it went down. I've already got a new server revving up. It should be up in you know, 60 seconds or 120 seconds. Um, your customer is going to appreciate that vastly over, yeah, I know it's down. I don't know what they did, but you know, the hosting service says they're going to get to it as soon as possible. Could be down for minutes, could be down for hours, could be down for days. We just don't know. So the, so the AWS system actually gives us that, that flexibility, that power, and that control uh, to at least be able to tell our customers um, and or our, our employers or whomever that the system is up uh, or will be up very shortly. So that's why I love the system. Not to mention the fact that the way it's built and the way it's constructed and the way it's piped um, as far as bandwidth is I've never had a problem with it. As a matter of fact, the, the system, uh, the snappiness, you know, you put in a URL that goes to an AWS site and its response is almost instantaneous. Um, as far as, now, I mean, that doesn't mean that you can 
you know, front end load a website to where you, you create a blocking system with JavaScript or something, and it'll slow down the actual load of the website. But the, the, the route from my computer across through the internet, through the routers, to the AWS server, and for it to respond back as a 200 uh, is, is virtually instantaneous. It's incredibly snappy. Uh, and I've never had a complaint with it. And I get to cross compare because I still actually have some customers that are using some of the big uh, hosting services. Uh, one of them highly recommended by developers. And of course, one of them is one of the uh, known large big branders that uh, most developers tend to, to avoid. Unfortunately, my customer had purchased all of his stuff through that uh, before speaking to anybody else, you know, because of the advertising. Uh, the advertising worked very well for them in that particular case. Unfortunately, uh, for developers and, and, and some other people, that's, uh, that's just the way it works. And we have to deal with that, and we have to use them. And it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's just, it's just when, when you do use them, sometimes uh, you don't really get what you pay for. Anyway, uh, so I want to show you how to set up a server using the AWS systems. It'll be your own server. Uh, if this is the first time that you've used the AWS system, um, you get two servers for free for one year. Now, the two servers are a primary gateway server, uh, a, a internet-facing server, so you can put anything you want to on it, whether it's APIs or a website or a WordPress site, you know, um, a game uh, backend engine, um, but even databases or whatever. Uh, though the second server they give you is a database server. It's that's all it does is uh, serve database functionality in whatever database that you're most comfortable with. In in my case, I use MySQL the most because it matches with PHP the the best right uh but you can you can do postgres you can use um uh um uh, uh sql server sorry let's think of microsoft sql server um uh, you can use um mongo or uh, any of a number of others and you can just look that up under what they call the rds that's relational database services and that's uh that's the secondary server that you can also have for one year uh, without any charge from, from uh, the Amazon services. So with, with that, I wanna go ahead and show you how to go ahead and set up one of these servers, and then we'll get into uh, the terminal, and we'll actually, because we're gonna load a Linux server. Uh, this is an Amazon semi-proprietary Linux server, um, though it's just basic Linux base. It's just preloaded with some packages, and some interface stuff to allow a uh, uh, little easier integration with Amazon. The, the you don't have to use these. As a matter of fact, let's let's go ahead and get started, and we'll talk about the sign-in. So when you do your sign-in, you're going to go to the the URL aws.amazon.com, and that will give you the sign-in. Now, if you're not a Prime member or you uh, have not signed in to Amazon before. This is a standard sign in. If you have never signed into anything, uh, you probably, this course is probably way too high for you. Um, but it's just a standard sign in. The only difference with this sign in is it does require a credit card. Now you're not gonna get charged anything unless you go overboard on what you're purchasing as far as services. But because the, the uh, hard drive for one server is free, the bandwidth, the, uh, the, the, the server itself and the relational database is free, there really shouldn't be any charges at all associated with it. If in fact there were charges, we're talking about maybe a dollar a month uh, while all this free stuff is happening. Now, you can buy more. You can, you can, when I first started this over two years ago, I purchased, you know, I, I went through the free, learned how to use it real quick, and I was so excited about it because of, of what I was learning and, and how it improved my interfaces with my customers that, you know, uh, way before I had used up the first year, I had 10, 10 uh, servers up and running. So obviously I was paying for those, and, and you will. 
But let's go ahead and, and, and do the sign-in. So you're going to have a sign-in. You'll go through the standard steps of that sign-in. And uh, uh, it'll ask for a telephone number. It'll ask for you know, your basic sign-in stuff that, that you're used to doing. And it'll ask for a credit card. Uh, and, and again, like I said, you're not going to get any surprise charges or anything like that. Uh, you can monitor your usage at any given time. And even right now, I think I'm using 11 servers. Uh, I've, I've prepaid for some, but, but the trickle charge, such as uh, bandwidth usage and um, uh, hard drive usage, uh, the, the gigabytes of hard drive that I'm using, I'm still looking only at like $25 a month in extraneous usage. Uh, now that's I pre-purchased servers, so that doesn't include the server costs. A lot of times, that just includes the uh, the uh, bandwidth and hard drives and things of that nature. But we're, we're talking a lot of servers and a lot of systems running uh, with a twenty-five dollar a month uh, charge. Anyway, uh, so go through the sign in and and uh, go ahead and sign in. So I have two accounts with Amazon. I have one to do the tutorials, and then, of course, I have, I have my primary, so you won't see my systems. Uh, this is a, uh, for lack of a better term, a dummy account. <clears throat> okay, so when you, when, once you've logged in, this will be your, what they call your dashboard. And in your dashboard, you're gonna have all their services, and you, as you can see, it's a massive ecosystem. Uh, as you learn about all the different products and services that they, that they provide, uh, and I don't use half of these. I mean, I, I probably, I, I don't use a third of these. I use the EC2, which stands for Elastic Cloud Compute, uh, which is their, which is their uh, servers. So your EC2, Elastic Cloud Compute Server System, um, is gonna be your primary system if you follow the route that I'm going. Now you can use their tutorials, but you're gonna bring up two servers because they do load balancing, Elastic Beanstalk, and auto scaling. So that's their default startup, right? Which is gonna be more than one server, which means that even if you get a free server, you're gonna be buying more from them than you probably need. Because I bring up one server at a time. I still only use one server. I don't use load balancing. I don't have a client currently that has that type of load system. Um, and I don't have, uh, um, I don't, I just don't have the system that needs an auto scaling. I don't have, I don't have sites that all of a sudden change in usage by millions and then stop and then change in usage. You know, something like weather.com. So when a hurricane comes through, all of a sudden everybody's looking at the weather channel. Uh, when the weather's normal, nobody's looking at the weather channel, you know, so they need that. They need that scalability, <coughs> excuse me, at a moment's notice. Um, so you've got storage. I'm, if you know anything about the AWS, the S3 storage is very popular. It's basically a, a, a large storage um, capacity server system. Uh, so it's just like a, a, a very big hard drive. Um, there's a lot of other stuff I do use. There's the RDS database system. Um, route 53 is if you want to do your DNS uh, uh, routing. So instead of using somebody, um, again, very popular. I, I don't want to name names. Uh, I simply just don't want to. So, but you know what I'm talking about when you when you talk about buying URLs. Uh, route 53 is the exact same thing as if you were to go through a hosting service, except you have complete control over it. You have control over the DNS. It's automatically interfaced into the ecosystem and it's uh, a joy to use and it automatically um, obscures your information. You know, you normally, if you go through a hosting service, they'll charge you like 10 bucks a year or 12 bucks a year or something to run that behind a, uh, a uh, firewall, you know, a, a, a visual firewall for, for uh, um, obscuring the data of the URL holder. Um, and you should, you know, for, for basic purposes, I think you should always kind of obscure that data. There's no reason for the, the public or malicious people to have your mailing address and your name and your email address and all that. Uh, you, you never know what people are going to do with that. Uh, and there's other ways to give that information out that are more controlled. Anyway, so it, it, it provides a lot of service uh, and it's, it's relatively cheap. I think it runs like 50 cents a month. 
um, for for that service per DNS uh, that you want to run. And of course, they're cancelable cancelable at any time. But you buy them in one year bulks. Um, let's see migration. Uh, what else? I, you know, there there's so much here. I, I use their work mail for mail systems. Um, and it's always a tough call with the work mail system because the work mail and the, the, uh, outlook, they, they cost the same about $4 per person per user, uh, whether you're using an exchange server from Microsoft or whether you're using work mail from, uh, from Amazon. And I, I would probably say that, that the outlook, uh, online exchange system is probably, it certainly has a nicer interface because it's an outlook based, uh, uh, product. Um, it also interfaces probably interfaces better, certainly with outlook, uh, the, the, the purchased outlook because the fact that it, uh, that it, uh, is, is talking to an exchange server, the, the, the work mail is, uh, also has a web interface. And you can attach it to a, uh, an email software program through its pop accounts and, and things of that nature. Uh, I, I use it um, for, for a number of different uh, uh, accounts, and, but I also have an exchange server uh, system. But again, both of them about $4 a piece you know, per month. Uh, and I think that's a little expensive for email, but again, I'm using them because I like their, their interfaces. And, and there's a num number of other things, whether you're doing, you know, Internet of Things or if you're doing game systems or you're doing APIs or backends or whatever. There's, they, they've just got a massive ecosystem. But to get back to our point, we're going to go ahead and talk about the EC2. So uh, it, once you log in, you'll have your, your recent visited services, and that would probably be blank if you haven't gone into this. Uh, so we're just going to come down here to all services. And what we want right now is the EC2. At the bottom of this page, you're going to have build solutions um, and learn to builds. So if you're building a website using their tutorials, they're going to start with Elastic Beanstalk. They're going to do load balancing. They're going to do auto scaling, you know, and that's great if you're working in an enterprise environment. Um, if you're just building a simple website, uh, an interactive website. Now, I mean, if you're just doing a billboard website with no interactivity, then you can use the S3 you know, storage system, which has a, which is like a, a, a hard drive that is, that is uh, web accessible, but to build an actual functional website that, that can run a server such as uh, Apache and to have, uh, you know, uh, a backend scripting language or language such as PHP or, you know, uh, JSP or whatever you want to run, then you're going to need to actually build a, a server website. And these, I, I think they're just overkill and they're going to cost you money. Even if, even with their free tier service, you're going to have the, the load balancer has to have two, two servers running. Uh, that's how it load balances between two servers. Uh, obviously auto scaling. If you, if you hit the limit of the scale, uh, uh, boundary, it's going to bring up another server to, to share that load. Um, and then of course, another server and another server, depending on how much auto scaling you want. Um, I, I just don't have anything that needs auto scaling. My, my clientele doesn't have that type of, of, uh, uh presence. Uh, even, even some of our big stores, we're just running bigger, bigger servers instead of trying, because the, these, the system is, is not something that, that probably reacts well with auto scaling. Um, and we don't get those types of hills and valleys. So, so we just run bigger servers for the, uh, for the big stores. Anyway, get back to the point. We're going to go ahead and start with the EC2. All right, so I just clicked on the EC2. And this is going to be your kind of your starting point. Now, I've, I've, I've run through this a number of times just to make sure that I don't, you know, so I'm familiar with it enough that I don't uh, have any pauses in my tutorials. So uh, this should be what you start with, uh, with zero on all these except your security group. You start with one security group. So if, if you're going to create an instance, which is your EC2, that's your starting point, it's going to be under running instances, or you can launch an instance from this button. Um, if, yeah, now you can see I ran this, I brought up an instance and I shut it down or I terminated it 
using their their terminology. It takes a little bit for this for this uh, uh, line item, the the server that I created and terminated, to actually just disappear from the screen. So you're going to see this terminated line on the video, but when you first start, there's obviously nothing there. So we're going to go ahead and create a new one, uh, and you can just pretend that this doesn't exist because this was my trial run. So uh, we can go under instances and launch an instance. So if we're under the EC2 dashboard from here, you can do run instance, you can launch an instance from here. They're all going to take you to the same basic place. If you hit a launch instance, it's going to take you to the list of servers. Uh, I'm going to go back and you can go from one instance to launch instance. It's going to take you the same place. So these are the, the available types of servers that you can use. And we're going to use this Amazon Linux AMI. Uh, it's free tier eligible. So if you're going to create, if you want to take advantage of that free tier for one year and you haven't already used it up, which is impossible unless you you have a have, have created these, um, then you're going to want to pick one that's free tier eligible. Uh, and as you can see, you can even get some Windows systems. Um, but once you get into the higher Windows systems and some of the other operating systems, there's licensing involved. So they end up costing money. And at any point in time, you can select them or and or look up their pricing. But this one's free and it's actually always free as far as licensing is concerned. So Amazon, Linux, AMI, never charges you a licensing fee for the operating system or anything associated with it. Uh, it comes bundle packaged with PHP and Docket and Docker and, and MySQL and uh, let's, let's see, it's got Postgres and many other packages, uh, obviously Apache and a number of other things. Now, they're, they're packages sitting on the server, so you still have to actually install them. You still have to, to install them and, and, and run them. Uh, but they're already pre-packaged, so you don't have to worry about that. You can go to the, to the, to the marketplace and, you know, pick a pre-built server. So that's always an option. Just watch your licensing, watch what the residual costs are, uh, and they will typically tell you right off the bat what the, what the residual monthly cost is on that. But I personally just kind of like to set them up myself because I, I know what I want. Um, so we're going to start with the Amazon Linux AMI. Uh, it's the top one on the list. We're going to select that and we're going to select the type of server, right? And it's not the operating system, but the hardware side of it. So, uh, the T2 micro is the, is the one that is free tier eligible and it's really a good server. So you look at something where it says low to moderate, uh, network performance realize this is a server. It's not a laptop. This is not a, a desktop computer. So, you know, if you said low to moderate in comparison to a laptop, or you said low to moderate in comparison to a desktop, that would bring up some red flags. But these are servers. So when you say low to moderate on a server, that's a completely different subject. Uh, I've run quite a number of, you know, fairly intensive websites on the micro without any problems whatsoever. The problem that I run into is if I'm running something like a WordPress site with a lot of plugins and I'm trying to run the SQL server on the same uh, server, the, the, the MySQL in the background on the same server, then yeah, we start to run out of memory. And, and you'll see that if you play around with it, you'll, you'll kind of learn what its limitations are. And it's really a memory limitation with the one gigabyte of memory. What ends up happening with a with something like a, a WordPress site is the WordPress site takes up X amount of memory, and then the database takes it takes up X amount of memory if you try and put them both on the same server. And then what happens is is it runs out of connections, and the uh, the database and the WordPress site disconnect, and you see this line when you go to your website that says database cannot connect to WordPress or database cannot connect to server. I can't remember which one it is. Uh, immediately, if you see that anytime, you've run out of memory. You've run out of connections and you've run out of memory on your, on your server. And that's the problem. Uh, you can fix it by either going to the next size level server or a better solution is to move your database system to a different server. And that's why they give you two, two uh, um, free servers is you get a database server under the RDS as well as the primary server that you get here. They're both, they're both the same size, that, that T2, which stands for a general service server, 
uh, and the micro. Uh, but on the database side, I have seen the, the t2.micro be able to run, I think I can run like 10 databases for, for, for uh, WordPress sites simultaneously. And I think I'm sitting in the 90% usage range on those servers. So the databases are really uh, efficient on, on, the, on the micro server. It's just when you start piling everything up on the same server. And you really shouldn't have your database and your primary software on the same server when you're doing a WordPress site anyway. Anyway, we're gonna stick with this. Uh, you can get very large. Um, as you can see, as we go up in size, you know, we're talking about some really, really big systems. Um, so you can always, you know, as, as if you're getting enough traffic to justify going to the next server, the server cost is incredibly minimal compared to what would I, what I would assume if you're getting that much traffic, the value of the traffic is. Uh, when you're looking at pricing on the, on the servers, you can just literally, so you're looking at pricing for the T2 micro, you can just do T2.micro pricing. And, you know, I mean, that's kind of nice, but just go to their pricing level here. And we're gonna look at the on-demand pricing. If you looked at their reserved pricing, uh, it will give the on-demand also. So let's, let's go to the reserved pricing because I want to talk about the reserved pricing real quick as well. Here's your nano. That's the smallest. Um, and here's your micro. And since we're using micro, I'm going to stick with this. But you can apply this to any other uh, service. So you get small and it goes up and up and up and up and up from there. But let's look at the micro service real quick. And... You're going to see that on demand. Now, on demand is you pay by the hour. You have no contract. You have no limitations. You know, you're simply paying by the hour. So on demand hourly, it's going to cost you 1.2 cents per hour uh, of use. Now, you get 750 free hours for this microservice per month, and you'll never exceed 750 hours in a given month. Uh, it's just mathematically impossible. So for one year you get that 750 hours every month for a T2 micro. If you have two T2 micros, that'll spill over in some months. So you'll actually get a little discount on your second T2 micro because you get 750 hours, um, whether it's one or two or 10. So if you're paying, if, if you decide to pay for um, another one or you want to build one or you go to uh, a different server or you need more space or et cetera, you can, prepay, which allows them to give you a, a pretty substantial discount. Um, even, even if you don't prepay and you just reserve it and say, hey, I'm going to be using this no matter what, they'll start giving you discounts because they can budget based on known income, right? So if you say, hey, I'm going to use this service for one year guaranteed, then they can budget because you're, they're guaranteed at least X dollars because you're going to use it for a year. Well, that budgeting allows them to give you substantial discounts. If you notice on the, the just doing a standard one year term, uh, if you're doing on demand with no, with no reservation, you're gonna pay uh, 1.2 cents per hour. If you guarantee that you're gonna use it for a year, just by saying, yeah, I'm not, I, there's no difference except I promise you I will at least be using a T2 micro. Any T2 micro, I'll be using one, guaranteed, for one year. Then the price automatically drops to 0.8 cents per, per, per hour. So you're going to get a 30% reduction right off the bat uh, by doing, by, by just telling them I'm going to use it for a year. And, you know, I, if, if you're doing anything with, with websites, you can almost guarantee that you're going to have at least one per year. So, so you can, you know, once you start building these things, you know what you're going to have as a minimum per year. So re reserving space starts to get, uh, not only it just becomes economically savvy, right? It becomes smart to, to, to prepay. So if, if I want to prepay, I can bring that price down to, uh, the effective hourly of 33, uh, 33% less. Um, in a one year term, I can pay $69 one time. And I now have that T2 micro server 
for one year. Now I can do anything I want to with that server. I can erase it. I can re restart a new one, right? I have to bring down the old one, but I, have to, I can restart a new one. I can bring one up from scratch. I can, I can put anything I want to on it. I can switch it out. I can change the software. It's irrelevant, right? It's just the hourly cost of a T1, uh, excuse me, a T2 micro. So uh, you're not limited. It's not like, oh, I'm buying a, uh, an Amazon AMI, Linux, and I really need an Ubuntu. Uh, I can't get rid of the AMI. That's, and that's not true. You can just, it's, it's simply the T2 micro server. So, so if you bring up two, you're paying for two servers per hour. Uh, if you bring up one, if you take it down and bring up another one, then you're, you're paying for one server. Okay, so, so just remember that and, and uh, you can get some pretty substantial discounts. Now I purchased mine in standard three year terms. So as you can see that for three years, I will buy uh, say a T2 micro, I'll pay $124 one time fee and now I have that micro server for a, a full three years at $124. And if we, you know, bring that out, that's, you know, 124, 124 divided by three, you know, so I'm paying $41 a year. Uh, so we divide that by 12. I'm paying $3 and 44 cents for my server uh, per month. Okay? And that's a T2 micro. So that's, you know, I don't, I don't know of anybody who offers those kind of pricing levels. Uh, it's, that's just absurd. So, so that's what I typically do. And I go with the, you know, biggest discount, the 58%. Now, now you can do this even with the larger servers. So if you find out that you're running a, a pretty plugin intensive, you know, WordPress site or something like that, and you need a larger server, you know, you're just looking at a little bit more money every single time you go up. So you get small and you got medium, you know, and, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, um, you know, up to the thousands upon thousands upon thousands, uh, you know, here's five thousand dollars for three years for what is this? This is a double extra large. You know, and these get these can get uh, uh, ridiculously large. I think we yeah. See now you're into the ten thousand dollar range, uh, twenty thousand dollar range, twenty three thousand, and it gets bigger and bigger. I mean, these are massive systems. These are the kind of systems that Weather.com uses uh, off the AWS system, uh, and they can afford to do it because, you know, obviously they're getting paid by advertisers and things of that nature for their click-throughs. So anyway, I want to talk about the pricing and that, that gets you clear on the pricing. Uh, you can either do it on demand and calculate your pricing uh, or you can start to do reserved pricing. And if you're doing reserved pricing, I'll show you how to, to, to purchase that reserved pricing. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, if you, if you, back up let's let's back up out of here real quick in your dashboard right so this is where you start off right down here is reserved instances so you can click on that and you can purchase a reserved instance so let's say you're running the you know Linux system uh, when you're running it in standard you're running a t2 micro you're gonna do the three-year terms and all up front and you do a search on that well there you go so there's 124 dollars and you'll add that to the cart you'll pay for it and then you have that server uh uh for three years uh and that's yours for three years so i just showed you that real quick i just wanted to show you how to do the reserved instance uh to lower your price if you start especially if you say hey this this free one's awesome i want more so you can do that reserved instance, and of course you can do it with any size and type. All right, so let's go ahead and launch our instance again. So we, we were going back through, we did the Amazon AMI. Here's our T2 micro. And you know, if you have questions, be sure and read through this. Because there is a learning, you know, a little bit of learning experience to, to go through this. And the more you learn, the more, the more you, uh, uh, the more you benefit from their ecosystem. So we're gonna configure the instance, and uh, we're gonna want one instance. <clears throat> more instances for auto scaling. So I can, I can bring up two or three on the same interface and basically they auto scale for me. So let's say I am weather.com and a hurricane's coming through, you know, you have normal usage and then all of a sudden you'll have a spiked usage of the weather channel when everybody's looking for, uh, 
basically looking for you know what the hurricane's doing. So that's what your auto scaling does. It starts bringing up other servers as your as your traffic and and needs increase, and then they go away as that traffic decreases. So it scales up and then it scales down uh, to to make sure that the pricing uh, is uh, most most optimized because you don't want 20 servers running at any given time when the weather's normal, but one server won't handle when a hurricane comes through. So that's the scaling system. We're gonna leave it at one because we get one free free system and we just, right now we don't need to pay for anything. Uh, we're not doing spot requests. Purchasing spot, spot instances gets a little bit cheaper because they know that you're not gonna be using up those resources. Um, your VPC is your virtual private connection. It's your internal uh, internal network. So it's uh, you're just gonna leave that at default. Uh, subnet, you can set up your subnets for, for, if you set up one computer in one subnet and another computer in the other subnet and you load balance the two, then you've got some additional protection. We're just gonna leave that as default. Um, these don't give you any choice, so just leave them at default. Uh, you can shut down behavior, can be stop or terminate. Uh, and that just means when you sh shut down a server, uh, it will literally terminate and erase the server. So just leave it at stop. Uh, you can protect against accidental termination. So if you had that set to terminate and you shut down a server and uh, you went through all the steps to actually shut down a server, it would actually come at the end and go, nope, if you've got protection on, you can't do it. So you had to go back and turn off the protection. And I, I don't really necessarily understand the, 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 how you can go through the steps of terminating and deleting a server accidentally, right? But I'm guessing, you know, they need it. So uh, uh, apparently there's a way to do it that, uh, that requires that. You've got your CloudWatch detail monitoring. Uh, you can go ahead and leave that, that blank for now. You don't get any more monitoring by selecting the detailed monitoring, you get the same monitoring more often. So in other words, instead of every five minutes, you get all the information on your server, you get it every 10 seconds, you know, something of that nature. I actually don't remember how often it is. Uh, it may tell you if you, uh, no, it doesn't tell you often, but you can look that up and, and, and see that, that the monitoring doesn't change. You don't get more information. You get the same information more often, right? In a, in a time frame. <clears throat> so uh, if, if you're running something like weather.com, then that would make sense to have detailed monitoring so that when you scale up because of a hurricane coming through that you can scale up as fast as possible as that traffic hits, all right? so. That would be something that that would that would apply. Uh, I don't use it because I don't have anything that needs to scale up. <clears throat> uh, and then leave this as its default. We're not running dedicated servers and we're not running dedicated uh, environments. We're running a shared hardware instance, but that's not the same shared hardware instance that you would expect from a shared host, right? Because um, in a shared host, you're literally sharing the pipe, you're sharing the computer, you're sharing you know, it's not separated out the same. When I purchase a, a virtual server from AWS, I, I have never gotten one server that acts differently than the other, right? I don't get one that's snappy and one that's crappy, right? Uh, they, they've all acted the same. They're all very quick. They're all responsive. Um, they don't act differently. Um, one doesn't use up more memory than the other. So it's not like going to one of the big ISPs or, or uh, hosting services and getting a shared server, in which case that it's a crapshoot in the case that uh, you, know, you may be sharing your server with a game host or a, you know, God forbid a pornography site or something like that, that at certain points of time, the entire bandwidth is used and the entire memory is used and you're just struggling to keep your website running at a usable uh, pace. Anyway, it's not the same. You just leave it as a shared and uh, we'll move on to the next thing. <clears throat> Here's our hard drive. We're gonna be using eight gigabytes, which is plenty for almost any uh, uh, server 
system. It's certainly plenty because it doesn't include the operating system. Um, or maybe it does. I, I actually have to go check them. But anyway, eight, eight gigabytes is quite a bit. You'll see that you have plenty of space if you go through and look at your hard drives after the fact. Um, and if you want more space, it's better to use the S3. Uh, that's the storage bucket um, that they provide to host large amounts. And there's even a, there's even a magnetic storage uh, um, hard drive system which is what they call the low access system. It's not, it's not speedy, but if you need to archive uh, information that is accessed very rarely, uh, then you can even use that. So you've got, I think, three different levels. You've got the instant GP, you know, GP2, you know, solid state drives for speed. And then you've got you know, the, the storage S3, which I think is just magnetic you know, mechanical drives, uh, which uh, aren't super speedy, but they can hold a lot of data. And then you even have just massive, uh, massive uh, archival bike backup systems that, uh, that allow you to do you know, terabytes of data, uh, but it's accessed rarely. So backups and storage and things of that nature that you don't use often, but you don't ever wanna lose either. Anyway, so we're gonna use the eight gigabytes. We're gonna, we're gonna pick the general purpose uh, solid state drive, which I think most hosting services actually charge you extra for or at least they used to. Um, unless you're using a lot of data and you're turning it over and it needs to be fast, some type of, of data system, um, you don't need the provisioned IOPS. But if you're, if you're flopping over large amounts of data constantly, then um, you, you may wanna look at something like, like a high uh, IOPS SSD, um, but you're probably gonna need a larger larger uh, gigabyte size because it needs to be able to, to, to use that hard drive for the IOPS. Uh, and then of course you can even go cheaper and go to the magnetic drive, but no real reason that I can see in doing that. So we'll do the general purpose um, and uh, go to the next step. Uh, you can do a delete on termination. That deletes your hard drive. I, I leave it checked because if I'm, if I'm terminating a a, uh, a server, I've already got the server backed up. I don't need to save its hard drive and orphan the hard drive for any, any reason in, a, in an orphaned volume. Uh, I'll have a snapshot, so I'll be terminating that server and I'll be bringing up a new server based on the snapshot. Uh, so I don't need to save its particular hard drive um, for any reason whatsoever. So I let it go out with termination. But if you, if you have a reason uh, that you can think of that you would want to keep the volume, uh, orphan the, the hard drive without the server, then you can certainly, you know, just uncheck that. Okay, so we've got that. And uh, now we come up to adding tags. Um, if you have a bunch of servers that have specific purposes, uh, this is, you know, you're, you may add tags to, to connect them to the ecosystem, right? So if you're, if you're using the internet of things and other, other things of that nature, this is just a way of labeling um, and tagging systems so that you can uh, kind of keep up and keep organized. Uh, I don't worry about it because I can name my server on the front end and I'll show you that right after we get, get it started. Okay, so the next step is the security group. This is basically the same thing as a firewall and we're gonna create a new security group um, for our servers, right? So if this is a web-facing server, we can use the same security group for all the web-facing servers if it's an email server, we can use the same security group for all the email servers. If it's a, a database server, then we can use the same uh, interface for all the security group for the, the database servers. But you're gonna wanna let certain things through based on what type of server it is. So um, again, like I said, it's, it's very similar to, to a firewall if it's not the exact same thing. So if I call this main server uh, security group. All right, give it a description if you if you want to. It's going to allow the secure socket uh, uh, hosting service through. That's your secure socket um, uh, what do I want to call that? I'm trying to think of what 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 to call that. It's the ability to go through putty or webstorm or PHP storm 
to connect to your uh, to your Linux uh, terminal. So whether you're using PuTTY or whether you're using um, uh, WebStorm or PHP Storm or one of the JetBrains uh, product line that have that interface that uh, that uh, secure socket interface then then this is how you get to it and it's actually one of the only ways you can get to the, the Linux server so that has to be open and right now it's open to the world that's the 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 forward slash zero um, and that's going to allow you to be able to communicate with the with the server itself so you're going to want to leave that. Now you may want to actually restrict that to your personal IP address. So you could go to, you know, what's my IP.org. And if I click on that, it'll tell you exactly what my IP address is. Uh, and you can then insert that here and that will prevent, uh, anybody else from getting into the system. You still need a key, uh, a PEM key, and you still have to go through SSH. So the likelihood of somebody getting through, even with this open, is you know pretty darn slim. They would have to be able to get a copy of your PEM key, and they'd be they'd have to you know basically know you know everything on how to get into the system. Not impossible, I'm assuming, because it does have the double layer of security. Um, I'm going to leave it blank now, but even on my personal system. I, I only allow my IP address through. So, um, it's one of those simple things, you know, you put your IP address in there and boom, it's done. Now this is going to be an HTTP, you know, lamp stack. So, you know, that's what we're building right now is a lamp stack. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add a rule and I'm going to allow HTTP through, uh, because it's an, in, you know, coming in interface, I am going to let all things HTTP into the system. So that basically covers that. That's your entire firewall security group because you're going to allow HTTP through and you're going to allow the ability to connect to a terminal. Um, if you wanted to, you could probably justify doing your HTTPS as well. And it's completely up to you. Uh, we obviously need to, to put in a security certificate uh, to have that function. So you can either put it in now or you can put it in when you put the security certificate in. And that would be a completely different tutorial because uh, you actually have to get into the, the um, operating system and you need uh, Apache and PHP to interface with that security system and then allow for that, secure, that, that uh, certificate to be used. Uh, and if you're interested in turning your EC2 into an HTTPS, uh, just let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll make a tutorial on it. It's, it's, uh, hard because there's not a lot of information out there. It's easy because it's not an enormous number of steps, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. We're creating the new server. We've given it a name. We've, uh, left the SSH and we're adding HTTP and for posterity's sake, we're adding HTTPS though. We don't need it to run the server. All right. So we're going to review and launch, and that's just going to give you a review of what you've set up. Um, we're going to hit launch and it's going to ask us to, uh, either choose an existing key pair, but since this is our first server, we don't have any key pairs, uh, or create a new key pair. And we're going to create this key pair. And this is how you securely attach to the server using SSH. And that's done through putty or some other secure interface. All right. I use WebStorm and PHP storm. So, uh, we'll just call this main servers, uh, key pair, um, error. there we go. Need to download that key pair. So we're going to download that to, uh, let's go ahead and just bear with me just here for a second. I'm going to delete those. All right. And, uh, You obviously don't have to do this. I just had down, done it before and I don't want to get mixed up when I go to use it again. Um, so we're just going to save that at this pretend I'm put it in a safe space, you know, wherever you keep stuff, uh, for this purpose, I'm just putting it on my desktop. We acknowledge that. And then we launch the instance. 
All right, now you're just gonna sit here and you can go view instances. So now we're gonna be launching the instance. Uh, I, I see that my terminated one had, has now refreshed and disappeared. So here's our instance now. Um, so, so now we have the uh, instance. We're gonna go ahead and just kind of click that and put main server, all right. Now we have the instance. It's uh, running and initializing. And uh, basically, it's just a Linux that's got a uh, internet-facing uh, network system. Um, we still don't have Apache on it. And we still don't have uh, a PHP server on it. If we wanted to, we could put MySQL on it, you know, to put in a database, uh, uh, a database system. I'm trying to think in my mind. So we've got basically we're building a LAMP server. So it's you know Linux, Apache. MySQL and PHP, but we're not going to put MySQL on it just for the fact that, well, you know what, we probably will. We just won't start it because we're going to use a, an RDS uh, server for, for our, our uh, uh, database system. But we'll go install it. It doesn't really hurt anything uh, because we're not going to start it. So therefore, it won't be using any memory. Um, so that's up and running. And uh, if we look at the info on it. Here is our public IP address right there. Now, there's a difference in this public IP address. The I IP addressing system on this is subject to change. All right, that simply means that if you reboot the server, uh, this main server, you may not, <clears throat> excuse me, you may not get this IP address again. That would be problematic if, it, if a DNS is pointing to it. So to resolve that problem, and a better solution is we use what's called an elastic IP. And what that is, is it's an IP address that we're assigned. And we can slip that IP address anywhere we want to. So if, here's an example of how it, it would be really, really nice in a, in, a, in a problem, a catastrophe. So we've got our DNS. Our DNS talks to or points to our our uh, elastic IP. This elastic IP may be attached to this server right here. All right, so that all works. The customer puts in a URL, the DNS points to this IP address, it responds back, that's our server, and that's how it works. The problem occurs when this server fails, right? What's nice is, is we can jump into our system real quick and jump this IP to another server and our DNS doesn't change. It's still pointing to this IP address. This is a brand new server that's, that's either just been brought up or is sitting in reserve, you know, depending on how important it is. So the old server failed. Maybe it's a piece of hardware. Maybe it's a software update that failed. Maybe it's just a glitch. Who knows? But whatever it is, just by moving this IP address to a new server, just attaching it to a new server, has rerouted the system and the customers have no idea. They don't know that the server just switched to a brand new server. All they know is the system is still running because now we've just jumped the IP address to a new server. So that's the really nice thing about the Elastic IP addresses. And what we're going to do real quick is we're going to set one up. So down on this left-hand uh, column over here, we can go to the, the uh, Elastic IPs. We're going to click on that. We're going to allocate a new address. Now you get five, uh, I think, you get five uh, IP addresses, elastic IP addresses automatically. Don't leave them running. You know, just if you're using one, use one. Don't allocate uh, IP addresses and not use them. Because it's a limited pool resource, right? Open outside availability IP addresses is considered a limited pool. There's only a strict number of them. So they, they issue you five, and if you use more than five, um, well, they won't give you more than five unless you request. And then it's like I did, I just sent them an email saying, Hey, I need some more, some more elastic IPs. And they were like, Oh, sure. Here, here's, here's uh, I think they gave me five more and said, if I need more, just give them, just let them know. But they do want to make sure you're actually using them because if you orphan them, then they're losing, they're losing IP addresses and, uh, for no apparent reason other than, you know, people's laziness. Uh, so anyway, for IP addresses, we're gonna allocate a new IP address and allocate it. There we go, we've got a new public facing IP address of 
234, 231, 116. Now, if you have a DNS, if you're using Route 3, that's even easier, part of their ecosystem. But let's say you're using a hosting services DNS, you went to the big, um, you know, the big advertiser guy, you can jump into their DNS uh, editor and you can now point to this IP address using their DNS servers. And that will allow all their server information to just simply forward right to this IP address. So we close that, we've got the IP address, now what we have to do is assign it or associate it with our new instance we brought up. And this will be a list of servers if you've got more than one. We just have one. So that will assign that IP address to this server. Now, if you're moving it, like I was talking about, if you're moving it to a new server, then you would select a different server here and you would hit this checkbox right here that allows it to slip to a new server. Without checkboxing that, uh, without selecting that checkbox, I'm gonna assume that it, it doesn't slip from server to server. It'll give you an error or some, some other uh, problem. So, but we're not moving it. This is the first assignment of this IP address to this server. So we're gonna associate it and Close that, and now our IP address is associated with our server. We can go back to our instance, and we can see that now we have that 34, 234, 231, 116. Now, we, we now have a, a public interface to our server, but we still don't have Apache running on it for, for our web server, and uh, uh, we have no... PHP or anything like that. Of course, Apache is all you need, but we do want the backend PHP um, as in this particular case. Now, you, this could be a node server or anything else. You can put anything you want to on it, uh, and they have pre-built node servers and everything else. Just just look at the uh, some of the pre-builts. Remember that marketplace? Uh, they have a lot of node servers that don't cost any money. Certainly, don't cost any more than than the standard T2 Micro, and they have free eligible free tier eligible systems uh, in all different styles, including the Node.js servers, you've got uh, you know, LAMP servers, you've got uh, Laravel servers, you name it, they've, they've got it. Uh, anything that you can think of that is you know, marginally uh, popular, they, they'll, they'll have a, uh, a system running it. Okay, so, so now we've got a public interface to it and our server's up and running, it's running Linux, all ready to go. So at this point in time, um, all we need to do is jump onto the actual server now and install those packages. But our server's running, we've got a public interface. The next step for me is I'm gonna bring up WebStorm, uh, maybe PHP Storm, but I will figure it out in just a few minutes because I'm gonna take a little small break. But uh, we're gonna bring up those, one of those two, and I'm gonna bring up my SSH interface uh, my secure uh, FTPS interface, and we're gonna log in to this IP address. And go ahead and, and hit Control C now. So we're gonna log into that address uh, through the terminal system to connect to the Amazon Web Services, uh, to our now server, right? Um, and that's it for right now. I'm gonna take a small break and then we'll be right back. Okay guys, I'm back real quick. Just need a little break, get some water. Um, anyway, uh, so we've got our server up and running. We've got our forward-facing IP address that we can get to publicly. So I'm just going to go ahead and bring in my WebStorm uh, that I went ahead and set up. I'm gonna just split my screen here real quick. <clears throat> and I'm gonna give myself a little room here. We've got our server, there's our IP address. Here's my WebStorm. Now to create a, a uh, secure shell into uh, the Linux server, I can do two ways. I can go directly by using tools and start SSH session, which will bring up an edit credentials and then jump into it. Um, or because I'm going to use it eventually anyway, I'm going to go ahead and clear this, get rid of that real quick, is I can go to uh, tools deployment and hit browse remote host and set up a remote host, which will be that, that unit. So I'm going to Click that, and I'm going to set it up as my AWS server. Uh, name it whatever you want to. We're going to go in through secure FTP. Hit OK. 
All right. And the host is the IP address that we copied earlier with the control C. So I just did a control V. Um, port 22 for SSH. So if you're using PuTTY, that's the port you're going to be using is 22. We're going to go into the root path. The username is always the same for the Linux uh, AMI. The, the Amazon Linux AMI is always the same. It's going to be EC2 user. All right. If you're using Ubuntu or another one, or if you're using one of the pre-builts under the marketplace, those may change and they'll give it to you in the instructions right as you look at it. All right, so our password is actually a key pair. So you've got OpenSSH or PuTTY, uh, if you're using those particular items. All right, so we're gonna look it up. It's on my desktop. This button gets me to the desktop in this program. And we had it under main server key pair PEM. All right, so we're going to add that. No, uh, There's no passphrase or anything. All right, uh, that gets us the entire thing. We can test our ST uh, secure, SFTP. Anyway, uh, so the it's going to give us a you know little warning here. We just hit yes. It's going to test it, and now we're successfully connected to it. All right, so we can hit OK, and that's going to bring up our server. And now this is the root folder of our server. So we're seeing every single thing inside the folder. And realize there's no Apache, there's no www, there's no HTML folder in here yet because we haven't even installed Apache on, on the server as of yet. So uh, we can go ahead, we've now got the server so we can actually view all the files on the server. And if we were gonna be setting up secure socket uh, layer, uh, S, uh, HTTPS and putting in a certificate, we would be working in, in this part of the system and this is how we can get to it. Um, so under tools again, now we're gonna go to uh, start SSH session, just like before, but we've already got it set up now for the AWS server. So we don't have to keep putting it in. So we're connected now. We're completely connected to the, to the uh, remote server. And I'm gonna go ahead now and, and minimize the, uh, the Chrome interface to it and go ahead and expand this so we can keep a good eye on that. All right. So the first thing it's going to ask you is to go ahead and update the, the server. So we're going to go ahead and update the server. You're doing exactly what it tells you to do. So it's the sudo for super user uh, yum update. So sudo yum update. And you can tag that with a dash y so that it doesn't ask you each for each step. Right, so it'll just update what it needs to update and uh, proceed with that update without asking you, here's the update available, do you wanna update this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so as soon as that's finished, uh, okay, so we're finished and I probably did a clever edit. That took about 60 seconds, uh, a little more time than I thought. Um, depending on when the last time the the package was set by Amazon depends on how big the uh, the uh, uh, update can be. So uh, from here, we've got our we've got our server. Everything's running. Now we need to install the lamp system. So I'm going to go back to splitting my screens here and bringing up the screen. And what we're going to do is look up AWS lamp. And it should give us a tutorial installing the LAMP server right there. Okay, so uh, for, at this point in time, we're just going to go straight through and follow their instructions to set up the LAMP server. And you could, can and should read through this uh, for the understanding of it. But I've done it a number of times and I've read through it all. So I'm just going to go ahead and follow their instructions uh, per copy, paste, and run. All right, through each one of their command lines. And we've already done the sudo yum update. Uh, the yum is their package manager, so that's why, uh, that's why the yum portion of it. Again, here we're gonna use yum to put in the uh, Apache, which is HTTPD 2.4. Uh, that's their Apache server. You've got PHP 7.0. You've got MySQL uh, version 5.6. And that's the actual server. And then you've got PHP 7.0 MySQL, which is the 
which is the uh, driver that allows PHP to talk to the My MySQL server. So even if you don't install this, you can eliminate this, this, this object in the line. You'll still want the PHP 7.0 MySQL, not 7.0, the PHP 7.0 MySQL uh, because that's the driver. So even if it's on a different server, you'll still need the driver for PHP to talk to uh, MySQL. All right, so we're just gonna copy this. And like I said, in this particular case, we're gonna go ahead and just install the MySQL server. We're just not gonna actually start it uh, just to keep everything simple, but you don't have to. Uh, you, can, you can not install that particular item. Okay, so, uh, and of course we use the, the dash Y so that it didn't ask us each time we were uh, installing. That's done, so we can go to the next thing. We can go and start our Apache service. So this starts our Apache now that we've got it installed. All right, we get a, a verbose uh, okay. We can do the uh, check config for the Apache server. And this ensures that if the server reboots, that Apache starts automatically without having to have somebody actually physically do the start command. Um, and then we can just make sure that everything started as expected. Uh, and you can, you can really skip this step and really just kind of move to the next one. But you're just looking to match the zero one, uh, excuse me, off, off, on, 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 off. So, you know, off, off, on, 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 off. And that, sh that tells you that everything's running properly. Um, at this point in time, your server is up and running. So we should be able to uh, go to our public IP address. Move over here. Because that link will take me to the other, other uh, manager. All right, so we should be able to, to do this and it should show us our Apache. Now, there you go. So now we have an Apache server up and running. Um, and this is, is Apache's default if it doesn't have an index uh, uh, file so that it shows you the admin test page. But now you've set up your own Amazon remote host system running, uh, running Apache. <clears throat> we just need to set up some security aspects so that the EC2 user, you, uh, and the Apache server can add files and add directories and such within the www uh, document folder. Okay, so um, we can, it's gonna talk here about adding the security groups. If, if, if you still can't get to it, you didn't add the right security group or, uh, and that was the firewall. Remember the security group for HTTP um, and make sure all that's up and, and, and allowing traffic in. Uh, and then of course, talking about the public D uh, DNS to point. So we now have our var forward slash www, uh, and I think it's forward slash HTML, and we can look at it right here. If we come over here to var, our usable root, here's www, and here's where our documents end up going right here for uh, um, you know your index files. And this, this is your, your basic root document of your website. <clears throat> so anything that we add right here ends up being uh, uh, the usable document root. And, it, and it's usable right now. We just need to set up some permissions so that if we're using things like WordPress or, or, or other items that the permissions will allow us to, to uh, make some changes as needed. So here's where we're gonna be setting our file permissions. And it, again, all we're doing is running right down the line and doing a copy and paste. So we have that, that gives us our Apache and user. Uh, at this point in time, because we don't actually exit the, the, the system, um, we're just exiting the interface, you can hit exit, because what they're wanting is a reboot. Uh, because we've now added the Apache group and if we hit exit and I'll show you if we hit exit which exits exits us out from the interface and then we reconnect right here 
and we do groups, you'll see that I still don't have the Apache in the group. Um, the way I always solve this is simply when I bring up a new system is uh, grab the, the server that, that you uh, created, actions, um, instance state, and hit reboot, and hit yes, reboot. Now, while that system reboots, you'll notice I got kicked off, as would be expected. The, uh, the system is going to reboot and all that software will set. And because we set the, con the config uh, to on, now, if I refresh that, obviously our server's down. So uh, everything you would expect from a reboot. Uh, because we set this line right here, this check config, uh, when it reboots, it will automatically start the uh, Apache server. So we don't have to actually worry about the fact that when we reboot, uh, we don't have a server there anymore. And looks like maybe we're back up. So you can see how incredibly fast that is for a reboot if you needed a secondary server to come up. Uh, we're no longer talking about minutes and hours and days for your host service. Uh, so the benefit is just... Uh, Immeasurable. The benefits immeasurable compared to, to running a hosting, uh, working with a hosting company. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and connect back to our system uh, under tools. And we're back up. Now, as you can see, because we already updated, it's not giving us anything saying, hey, we should update. Uh, and it will. So when you, when you log into your SSH and work on your servers or anything, if it's time to update, then it will tell you. All right. And now we can do groups and we have the Apache group uh, added to the set. All right. And now we just continue to go on down and we're going to give file and folder permissions to our www uh, directory so that uh, the user and the Apache system can add and remove files within this folder only uh, at will. All right, so let's see. That's it. So now you, you've, you've set it up, you've set the permissions. It, it would have still worked. I mean, if you dump up some, uh, some uh, uh, files into the HTML. The problem is, is if you tried to copy anything from here into HTML, it probably would have blocked you and said you don't have permissions. So we just gave ourselves permissions. Uh, so if we're looking at a project and let's say, just say I want to put a new, um, uh, a new file here and we'll just call it index. Oops. Dot HTML and we'll run HTML five for Emmett. All right, let's squeeze out here and in our body, we'll just put a, you know, just for the sake of because we'll just do hello world. All right, we'll save that. And now we can literally copy this, bring it right into our HTML, hit paste. All right, so we're now we're in there. And now if we refresh this, because now it has an, uh, an index file, we'll get the hello world. So, th and this is the nice thing about you know, WebStorm and PHP Storm, you really do have an integrated environment. Uh, you're, you're building on the left-hand side, you're, you're uploading on the right-hand side, you have this, this ecosystem, you've got your, your terminal at the base, which you can do uh, Windows terminal systems, um, and you can obviously do the shell terminal out to the actual Linux computer. So all of this working together in an ecosystem is really nice in, in WebStorm or PHP Storm. So uh, and they do a free trial, so just go to jetbrains.com or whatever it is and uh, check it out if you're, if you're interested in an IDE or if your IDE is, is something that's not, not completely what you like. Uh, I know that if you're looking for an IDE, I, I really like uh, the Visual Studio Code, which is their Visual Studio uh, Lite version. Uh, it's completely free. It's open source. It's really good. It doesn't have all these features. Uh, it does have a terminal, which is really nice. So connecting into a Windows terminal, uh, it does have that ability. And it has some other things. It's got Emmet and it's got uh, um, 
a number of of key uh, enhancements. It's got uh, IntelliSense, which is, you know, as you type, if you're typing uh, something, it gives you suggestions, and the closer you get to that suggestion, it narrows it down. That's in, that's what uh, Microsoft originally called IntelliSense way, way back in the day. And of course, that's what we call it, at least I call it now, uh, throughout the IDE environment, integrated development uh, environments. Uh, and it's really nice. Uh, you can use things like Note, Notebook++ plus plus or whatever, uh, Notepad++, plus plus, and uh, it'll, get you, it'll get the job done. But uh, even the best programmers don't remember everything, so that IntelliSense allows us to uh, work a lot faster. <clears throat> anyway, enough of a plug for WebStorm or PHP Storm or whatever you're using. Um, so, so that's it. Now you've got that whole system up and running. PHP is running on the, on the server, and we're going to show you here real quick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut all that down real quick and bring this up over here and then down here in the terminal. Let's go back to our uh, instructions tutorial that they provide. And we're just going to echo out a PHP file uh, to the directory to make sure that Apache has all the appropriate um, permissions to write to it, because we're going to use Apache to echo out and write PHP to the to the folder. So if that failed for some reason, then you you need to go back and go through the permission set again. You know, just cut paste and and see if you missed something because uh, it would mean that uh, we don't have file permissions to write into that folder. So now if we refresh that folder, we should have the PHP info. And if we're looking at the uh, IP address, we can then actually type the file name and we'll get the uh, PHP info uh, INI kick out right there. So the complete setup of uh, PHP. And, and that's it. So, so now you see it. Now, if you're using uh, WebStorm um, or PHP Storm and you want to keep this configuration, you can, whoops, HTML, uh, hit that. And then, of course, in your mappings, I say, of course, then in your mappings, hit a forward slash here so it can upload and download. Uh, otherwise, it it, it doesn't associate the upload and I'll show you what that shows. So this is going to get you to, to your folder and let's just hit okay and I'll show you. So now you don't see all that other server stuff, right? So now you're just in your HTML folder where you would normally work. Uh, you still have complete access to the entire server simply by backing out here if you want to get to it. But for most of us who are just working here, we just want to see our main root of our uh, internet facing folder. <clears throat> and uh, I was going to show you something. I can't remember what it was. Um, oh, oh, okay. So, so now if, I, if I'm using my project over here uh, and I want to upload something, I can do the right click and upload to AWS server. If that mapping, that forward slash I put in the mapping uh, right here, if that doesn't exist, it can't map automatic uploads because it's missing a forward slash. Uh, pretty, pretty simple stuff, uh, but that has to be set to a forward slash, so that's why I set that. Two tabs, connection tab, this is your primary connection. This is gonna be your starting folder. Your mapping for deployment needs to have that forward slash because it starts off like that, right? So it can't deploy anything. So you just hit that forward slash and you're good to go. And then that allows you to just simply, if you're uploading an index file, um, and I'll do it here real quick. We'll open it up and and uh, just, I don't know. There we go. We'll just do that. So if I want to deploy that, I can just upload that to the AWS server. And uh, by getting rid of my PHP, there you go. So there you go. Now you have a complete server um, and complete running system. And however you upload to your servers, whether it's uh, you can't use F you can't use FTP unless you actually install 
the FTP services, and that's a completely different subject. Now, you can just look up on the web for AWS and FTP because you need to install that, that functionality into your server. You'll also need to open up the security ports for FTP. Um, so just remember that, that stuff as you, as you go through. Uh, the best way to work with it, it really for me is, is simply using WebStorm or PHP Storm through the SSH. Uh, if, if, you, um, if you find another IDE that has this, SS, this SSH capability, built right into it hey let me know because as of right now this is the only ide that i know that has this ability to jump into a to a, a foreign linux server on windows <clears throat> um, and it's super nice so if there's other options for other users to use that would be that would be really cool <clears throat> excuse me that would be really cool for me to be able to let them know uh of other uh opportunities in that now, again, like I, like I said before, we're still using a public-facing IP address. That would obviously typically want to be changed uh, using a DNS. You know, you'd buy your URL through whatever. I use Route 53, again, through AWS. Um, if we're looking at the services, we can go to Route 53, and you can find that on the main dashboard or anything else. Uh, we can open that up. And it's DNS management, so I mean, really, domain registration, the whole bit. So, you know, if I'm if I'm, you know, checking to to start up a new domain, I'm gonna, you know, uh, xyz.com, obviously, uh, and we know that's taken, but you can check it, and it'll check for you doing the standard who is check, <clears throat> and uh, you know if it's available you can add it to the cart. Um, so they give you all the options, standard pricing, costs you $12 a year. Uh, that may seem a little bit more expensive than some of the hosting services who either give it to you for free or at a discounted rate, though they typically do charge you to, uh, to uh, hide the data on the uh, user admin for... Uh, for the URL, which you need to do uh, in almost all cases. Uh, and that normally costs like nine or 10 bucks extra. And then all of a sudden you've lost all your discount. But, uh, and, and this one does it automatically. You know, you just, you, the checkbox is automatically checked as you go through. So you literally have to uncheck it to uh, uh, have that publicly available. <clears throat> it's $12 a year. It may seem expensive, but the reason that the other services can give it to you cheaper is because they're burying other costs and sliding those numbers around to the uh, actual cost of the server and such. So that you're not really benefiting a whole bunch by them giving you a cheaper DNS. But it doesn't hurt. So if you want to use a DNS from another another company uh, and simply point that that DNS to your uh, to your uh, public publicly available IP address, that one works fine too. All right, so I think that gets you covered. If you have any questions, leave them in the uh, comments below and I'll see if I can answer them the best I can. Uh, this is kind of a precursor to continuing on with the view courses that I do uh, as we work on the remote uh, hosts because we would need one of these to do a secure uh, SSL HTTPS server because one of the things that we're going to be getting into uh, shortly is going to be uh, the PWAs, which are becoming really popular. That's personal web applications or professional web applications or whatever you want to name it today. It's, it's uh, progressive web applications. Um, but what, we, what we're going to be moving to, as long as Google and the Internet of Things and everybody is moving in that direction, as long as Apple falls along, then the PWA uh, architecture should start to take over uh, and be at least equal to the native systems. It just depends on where Apple and Google take that system and how far they allow us to go because right now the uh, internet interfaces through Chrome and Safari allow almost the exact same uh, connectable interface to your mobile device 
as if you were doing it native. And then the only advantage of native would be sheer speed and the fact that the system is local to uh, that particular hardware. And since you're writing in the hardware of the application instead of through a proxy, which would be Chrome or Safari, uh, it's gonna be faster. But for most people, that absolute speed is not necessary in the application. Now, we're not talking about lag, we're talking about the speed of the actual application. So if you're writing a graphic intensive game, then you're probably gonna want that native. If you're writing a interactive database, then you don't really care, right? I mean, the PWA is absolutely fine. You're not looking to reduce flicker because you're not gonna get any flicker out of your database interface. You may get a flicker out of you know, trying to create a HTML uh, canvas game and having it work uh, in real time on a, uh, uh, an iPhone or a uh, Android phone. Anyway, uh, that's what we're doing. We're creating precursors to allow us to, to create those uh, HTTPS uh, remote servers so that our PWA works because Service Worker and I think some other things uh, require secure socket layers, secure services, uh, TLS to, uh, to work properly. Um, you can't actually properly design them on your local computer unless you can simulate an HTTPS on your local computer. If you know how to do that, let me know because I don't know how to do that. Uh, I only know how to do that on a remote. I don't know how to set up a, a, uh, a uh, secure uh, certificate on a local Windows server with a web, some type of web uh, uh, server, uh, short of actually creating a real server. Anyway, um, I think that's it. So uh, if you liked it, hey, give us a, a thumbs up, a thumbs down if you didn't like it. And if you didn't like it, please let me know why, because I'm always trying to improve these. Uh, improve the hardware, just got new uh, uh, audio systems. So hopefully that sounds a little bit better, uh, running a shotgun mic, uh, so it's, there's nothing in front of me. Um, and uh, obviously improving the resolution to try and make it uh, readable on small of an item as possible. Um, we switched to the uh, uh, 16 by 9 resolution uh, a couple, couple uh, videos back, uh, the aspect ratio of 16.9, and we've dropped the, the resolution to 720p so that if you're running 720p or 1440, uh, obviously, uh, you should be able to see these with no problem. Um, my, my problem is space and trying to figure out how to, how to move everything around in such a tiny space. But I'm working it out and it works out so far okay. Um, subscribe so you can get the next ones and see what else we've got coming up. Um, and like I said, we're going to be moving on to some PWAs. I'm going to be doing a uh, um, routing. Uh, view routing, uh, in-depth routing, and not just the simple routing, but nested, nested, nested routing. So a lot of people have been asking about how the route system works if, if you're running you know, a primary uh, menu bar and then maybe a secondary menu bar, and then maybe you've got some widgets that you want to be able to switch out. So you're running three levels of nesting, um, and, and view allows you to just continually nest the route system. And it's actually, it's, it's, uh, I'd say it's pretty simple, but you know, do it a couple of times and then it starts to become a little, uh, a little more simple. Uh, but yeah, it allows you to do all kinds of stuff like that, especially the nested routing, which is um, um, something I was worried about when I first started because I had had ideas of dashboards that had switchable parts in them. And uh, not only that, of course, there's a main menu and then a, a whole ecosystem of, of menus that uh, would take you to different parts of the site, uh, take you to different pages of the site, and of course, uh, then switch out pieces and parts of the site, which is a lot of nesting. Uh, anyway, that's what I uh, plan on getting to next time, and uh, hopefully this will hold you over for a couple days until we get to uh, pulling that up. Thank you guys. Uh, keep coding. Uh, subscribe. Um, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, leave a comment uh, if you have any questions, and of course, leave a comment if you uh, didn't like it and would like to see something changed. Uh, again, thank you guys. Keep coding. We'll see you next time. Bye.